Okay, today we conclude a series we've been in now for a number of weeks called Faith and Reason. Here's, if you're new, this is your first time here. We're looking at the rationale behind the Christian faith. Why it makes good sense to be a Christian. Now, the, there's really a twofold goal to this series for the church. Goal number one is to help you understand and affirm in your mind and heart that it requires far more faith to reject the claims of Christianity than it does to accept them. In other words, Christianity's claims are logical. It makes sense to be a Christian. But there's another goal behind this of this sermon series, and it's this. To equip you to answer Christianity's critics. Because you know this. Christianity today is under what I'll call an intellectual assault by an increasingly secularized culture. Here's what I mean by that. If you're a Christian and you believe, you really believe what the Bible teaches about heaven and about hell and about there being only one way to God, if you really believe what the Bible says about marriage and sexuality, if you, believe all, if you really believe all those things, then our culture labels you as not that bright. Because religion is this feeling, emotional-based experience that is subjective. If you want to know something, go to school or to a university. If you want to believe something, go to a church. But there can't be any intellectual rigor associated with Christianity. And that is a relatively recent phenomenon, as I explained a few weeks ago. The reality is, logic is on Christianity's side. So over these past several weeks, we have examined things like truth. We've examined creation, the creation account. We've examined the Bible. And we've offered evidence, strong, solid evidence that support those Christian claims. But today we conclude by an examination of the one who literally stands at the center of Christianity. The one man who really does stand at the very center of all we believe, of course, I'm talking about Jesus Christ. A man named Jesus Christ stands at the center of Christianity. In other words, Christianity rises and falls on that one man. Let me say this a different way. If you remove Jesus from Christianity, you have nothing left. Christianity revolves around the resurrected person of Jesus Christ in a way that makes Christianity far different from every other religion in the world. For example, if you take Muhammad out of Islam, which is exactly what happened in 632 AD when Muhammad died, if you take Muhammad out of Islam, you still have Islam because while he was alive, Muhammad taught things that have endured after, long after his death. So you can take Muhammad out of Islam and still have Islam. You can take Buddha out of Buddhism, which is exactly what happened in 544 AD when Buddha died. But you still have Buddhism long after Buddha's been removed. Why is that? Because while he was here, he taught things that have endured beyond his life. Christianity is different. Because Jesus did not give us a message. He made Christianity all about himself. I'll give you one of probably the most popular examples of this. John 14, 6, Jesus said this. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, let me compare and contrast that to the way other religions might have said this. I have come to show you the way. That's not what Jesus said. 
He did not say, I've come to show you the way or I have come to show you the way to the Father. He made it all about himself. Did you notice that? I am the way. No one comes to the Father except through me. So if you remove Jesus from Christianity, there is literally nothing left because Christianity is all about this single person. It rises and falls on the person of Jesus Christ. So here's what I want to do. I just want to examine. Was Jesus who he claimed to be? Was Jesus really who he claimed to be? If he was, then certainly he deserves our attention. But if he wasn't, we need not worry about the rest of his claims. So let's start by reminding ourselves who it was that Jesus claimed to be. Okay, if we're gonna, it was Jesus who he claimed to be. Who did Jesus claim to be in the first place? If you have your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. This is one of many passages of Scripture in the New Testament where Jesus claims his identity. All right? John chapter 14, Jesus is appearing before the high priest and the religious leaders just before he would go to the cross. And they are trying him for blasphemy. And I want to read to you this conversation. Let's all stand together for our sermon text this morning. Mark chapter 14, beginning with verse 61. The high priest asked Jesus, point blank, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? Verse 62, I am, said Jesus. And you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. Now watch the response. The high priest tore his clothes why do we need any more witnesses, he asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned Jesus as worthy of death. You may be seated. I'm not sure how anything could be more unambiguous than this. There is no confusion here. The high priest asked Jesus point blank, are you the Messiah, the Son of God? And Jesus answered, I am. In other words, Jesus claimed to be the Messiah, the Son of God. And after he said, yes, that's who I am, he went on to use language from Daniel's prophecy about this Messiah that used words like the Son of Man and how he would come on the clouds See, the, the point is the religious leaders here knew exactly what Jesus was claiming. They knew he was claiming to be divine. Otherwise, they wouldn't have charged him, convicted him of blasphemy. They knew exactly what Jesus was claiming. Now, so it shouldn't be surprising to us that as we read the New Testament, we find Jesus doing things and saying things that only God can do and say. For example, Jesus forgave sin. Listen, only God can do that. And Jesus did it. Jesus instructed his followers to pray in his name. He even accepted worship from people. People would fall down and worship Jesus and Jesus would not say, no, get up, I'm just a man. No, no, no. He accepted their worship as legitimate and as appropriate. See what I'm, Jesus really believed that he was and he claimed to be the Messiah, the son of God. So here's the question. Was he really? If he was, he deserves our attention. If he wasn't, we can write him off. What evidence is there that Jesus was who he claimed to be? I want to offer a few thoughts here. First of all, Jesus fulfilled messianic prophecies. 
It is the Old Testament, the Jewish Tanakh, the Old Testament, is filled with prophecies about a divine deliverer called the Messiah who would one day come. And these prophecies were very descriptive. So just anybody couldn't be the Messiah. The Messiah, when he came, was preceded by descriptors. How many of you have ever ordered an Uber? Y'all ordered an Uber? Who, who's used the Uber out? Let me see your hands. Okay, not many. Okay, a lot more in the first crowd. Okay, let me, share, let me just share with you. Let me share with you how Uber works. There's an app. And you say, come pick me up. It knows where you are, GPS. Come pick me up. When you order an Uber on the Uber app, it comes back and it tells you, okay, the, the car type that is gonna pick you up is this kind of car type. It's this color, it's got this tag number, and here's the driver's name. Now, why does Uber provide all of that information to you long before your ride gets there? Because if someone were to pull up claiming to be your Uber driver and their car didn't match, their name didn't match, their tag didn't match, you know that that person's an imposter and you're not going to get in their car. Similarly, the Messiah was preceded by descriptors so that we could know when the real Messiah came, we would know he's not an imposter. And Jesus fulfilled these messianic predictors or prophecies, descriptions about who the Messiah would be. Now, let me say a couple things about these. Uh, the first thing that's important to note, especially in light of critics, what critics might say, many messianic prophecies are beyond human control. Okay, here's, here's why this is important. Let's say somebody living today wanted to be the Messiah. All they'd have to do is go back to the Old Testament and read what the descriptors were of the Messiah and they would just have to do those things. For example, one of the Old Testament prophecies about the coming Messiah was that the Messiah would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. If I'm a Messiah wannabe, all I got to do is go out and get a donkey, ride into Jerusalem on that donkey, and I have fulfilled one of the Messianic prophecies. But many of the Messianic prophecies, see, the problem with think, that line of thinking is that many Messianic prophecies were beyond human control. For example, the prophet Micah says that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Okay, that is not something a Messiah wannabe can arrange ahead of time. He can't choose where he's going to be born. The Old Testament said things like this. The Messiah would be betrayed by one of his so-called friends. Okay. Someone can't control what someone else does, especially if they're an enemy. So many of these messianic prophecies... We're beyond human control. So Jesus couldn't simply pretend to be the Messiah and try to convince people that he was. But here's the real kicker about these messianic prophecies. Only Jesus fulfilled them. Only Jesus fulfilled these prophecies. Now here's why this is important. Some critics might say, well, wait a minute. Okay, so Jesus fulfilled some of the, the messianic prophecies. Given the number of Jews living at any given time, many people probably fulfill the Messianic prophecies mentioned in the Old Testament. So maybe Jesus did, but maybe other people did. Maybe other people will. That doesn't necessarily mean that Jesus is the Messiah. Well, the problem with that is it turns out not to be the case. Only Jesus did fulfill these prophecies. There are over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament that describe what the Messiah will be like, will describe his com that describe his coming. All right. There are 61 major prophecies, 61 major messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. Okay. Years ago, there was a man named Peter Stoner who was a mathematician, and he did a study. And here's what he did. He took eight specific messianic prophecies out of the 61 uh, major prophecies out of the over 300 in the Old Testament. He took eight of them. And he calculated the chance 
that any one person could fulfill all eight of those messianic prophecies. Now, I just want to, just for clarity, I want to share with you the, the, the specific prophecies on which Peter Stoner's calculations were based. Here they are. Eight major messianic prophecies he used. The Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. It was predicted in Micah, came true in Luke. He, was, he would be preceded by a messenger. He would enter Jerusalem on a donkey, as I mentioned. He would be betrayed by a friend. He would be sold for 30 pieces of silver. That money used to sell, to, uh, sell him would be thrown down in God's house. The Messiah would be silent before his accusers. And the Messiah's hands and feet would be pierced. Prophesied long before Roman crucifixion was a thing. Okay, so all of these prophecies given to us in the Jewish Tanakh, in the Old Testament, that were fulfilled in the life of Jesus, here's what Peter Stoner did. He calculated the probability that one person could fulfill just those eight prophecies. And here's what he found. The chances of a person fulfilling those eight prophecies is one in 10 to the 17th power. Okay, that's one chance in one with 17 zeros behind it. Now, I know that we don't grasp numbers that big. That doesn't mean much to you. So here's what Peter Stoner did. He came up with an illustration to quantify that probability. What does one in 10 to the 17th power really look like? Here's the way Peter Stoner described it. He said, take silver dollars. Y'all know what a silver dollar is, a little bigger than a quarter, silver dollar. And take enough silver dollars and go out to Texas and start putting them on the ground, edge to edge. And put silver dollars edge to edge until you have covered all of the ground in the state of Texas. Okay, y'all with me? Silver dollars all over Texas. After you have done that, go back again and put silver dollars, put a second layer of silver dollars edge to edge all over the ground in Texas. And Stoner said, keep doing that until the stack of silver dollars all over the state of Texas is two feet deep. That's a lot of silver dollars. Then he said this, take one of those silver dollars, put an X on it, throw it in and take a big something spoon <laughs> and stir up all those silver dollars all over the state of Texas until they're mixed in really, really well. Then put a man in an airplane with a parachute and just fly him all over the state of Texas randomly. Put a blindfold on him so he can't see what's happening. Put a blindfold on him and just tell him, anytime you want to, jump out of the plane. So the man, somewhere over the state of Texas, jumps out of the plane, parachutes to the ground, blindfolded, reaches down, picks up a silver dollar. There is a one in 10 to the 17th chance he picks up the one with the X. Okay. In other words, very, 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 very low probability. Now, if that isn't convincing... If that's not convincing that Jesus is the only one who fulfilled the messianic prophecies, let me, remind, let me remind you, Peter Stoner only based this on eight. He did a further calculation. Not what's the likelihood of one person fulfilling eight prophecies. What's the likelihood of someone fulfilling 48 of the 61 major prophecies? He calculated that to be one in 10 to the 157th power. There are not enough silver dollars to illustrate this. Okay, what am I saying? If, if the objective is to be logical, if logic is really what we're after, it is logical to believe that Jesus was who he said he was because of the way in which he fulfilled every single messianic prophecy about him. But it doesn't stop there. Let me offer a couple of other thoughts here. Here's another reason we know that Jesus was who he said he was. He performed miracles. He performed miracles. 
Now, let me clarify something here because there can be confusion about this. Jesus did not perform miracles just to help people. Although most of the miracles Jesus performed did help people. Most of them did. But that was not his objective. Now, how do we know that? Because if Jesus' objective in performing miracles was to help people, he would have emptied all the hospitals. That was not his objective. What was the objective? What was the purpose of the miracles that Jesus performed? Jesus performed miracles to validate that he was who he said he was. I'll give you an account of this. Uh, there was a man named John the Baptist who was Jesus' forerunner. And John the Baptist heard about Jesus and his ministry. So he sends some of his own followers over to Jesus to find out about him. Let me just, I'll just read this to you. When the men, John's, John the Baptist's disciples, came to Jesus, this is in Luke chapter 7, they said, John the Baptist sent us to ask you, are you the one who is to come? In other words, are you the Messiah? Or should we expect somebody else? Now, Dr. Luke here puts something, inserts something. He says this, at that very time that they asked this question, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits and gave sight to many uh, who were blind. So Jesus replied to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. In other words, Jesus didn't say, go back and tell John who I say I am. He didn't say that. He said, go back and tell John what you have seen me do. The miracles of Jesus were intended to validate that he was, in fact, the Messiah, the Son of God. Now, I want to, let me mention one thing about this. Jesus' miracles really were supernatural. In other words, they're not just tricks, okay? We've all seen illusions or tricks. People pull one over on us, you know. It looks like something supernatural, but it's not really. Y'all know what I'm talking about? How many of you have ever seen David Copperfield? Or somebody like that. Okay, an illusionist, master illusionist. They get on stage and they, do, they make these things disappear and you think, wow, you know, that's supernatural. That can't possibly happen. It's a miracle. Okay, that is not what this is about. How do we know that Jesus' miracles aren't just illusions intended to pull something over on us? Here's how we know this. Something called the mask magician. How many in the room have ever heard of or watched the television show starring the masked magician? Let me see your hands. You guys really need to watch more television. <laughs> I just, all right, so let me just explain for those of you who never heard this. All right, so the masked magician is an insider that runs with all these master illusionists, you know. And uh, except he, he's, got a, he's got his own television show, very successful, very popular, not to this crowd, but very popular. And uh, his show was all about uh, repeating illusions that these master illusionists pull off, but then he shows you how they did it. He takes you behind the scenes and shows you the secrets whereby they trick their audience to believe something that's really not true. That's what he's all about. Okay, here's one of the reasons we know that Jesus' miracles weren't just tricks or illusions to pull something over on us. There's never been a mass magician. Many of Jesus' miracles involved local people, thousands at a time sometimes. And never one time did any of those people who were involved in the miracle itself, never one time did they raise their hand and say, wait a minute, I know what Jesus wants you to think, but that's not really what happened. He, I was in on this. He's just trying to pull something over. That never happened one single time. You know why? Because what Jesus did truly was supernatural and miraculous. They weren't just tricks. Here's another reason we know that Jesus' miracles weren't just illusions or tricks. Even his skeptics acknowledged that his miracles were supernatural. Not just his friends, 
but those who were against Jesus. One night, a man who was a member of the Pharisees, he was a Pharisee, member of the Sanhedrin, came to see Jesus. His name was Nicodemus. Let me read to you some of that conversation. There was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council, the very ones who had Jesus put to death. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know, not I know, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. Why does he know that? For no one could perform the signs you're doing if God were not with him. Presumably speaking for the Sanhedrin, we know, representing that ruling council, we know that you are a man come, or a person come from God, God himself, God in the flesh, because of what you're doing. It's interesting to me. No one who witnessed the miracles of Jesus questioned whether or not they were supernatural. You have to be a liberal theologian 2,000 years removed from the fact to question whether or not the miracles of Jesus were truly supernatural because no one there did. Even his critics understood that they were supernatural. It was a validation that Jesus was who he said he was. And I want to finish with this because in a way, this really is the most compelling. Jesus lived a sinless life. Jesus, Jesus, while he was here on earth, lived a sinless life. Now, why do I say that is perhaps the most compelling? Because everybody in the room knows how hard, how impossible that is. Let's suppose I said, okay, today, church, we're launching into a new campaign. We're going to call it No Sin for Three Months. And our church is going to covenant together that for three months, not a single one of us is going to commit a sin at, of any kind. Okay, y'all in? I didn't think so. <laughs> I mean, that's impossible. No, everyone knows how impossible it is for a mere human to be sinless. And yet Jesus was sinless. Now, how do we know Jesus was sinless? It's not because of what he would claim. I mean, somebody claiming that they're sinless doesn't hold a lot of water. How do we know Jesus was sinless? Here's how we know. Because those closest to him said so. Think about your best friend in all the world. Think about your best friend. If someone were to ask your best friend, is he or she perfect and sinless? Now, look, your best friend may think the world of you. They may rave about you. They may give you all kinds of accolades, but they are not even going to think about saying, claiming that you are perfect and sinless because they know better. And yet, those closest to Jesus claimed that he was sinless. Just a couple of quick examples. Peter said this. He was without blemish or defect. John said, in him is no sin. The apostle Paul said, he had no sin. Those who knew Jesus best claimed him to be perfect and sinless. So what does all of this mean? If Jesus really was who he claimed to be, the Messiah, the Son of God, here's what that means. He really is worthy of our attention. And we had better pay attention to the claims that he made. If Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God, for example, let me just return to where we started. We need to pay attention to this claim. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, let me ask you a question. Why is it that only the Messiah, the Son of God, could say something like this? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Let me explain with a story I've shared with you before, then I'll be finished. When I was in college, I had a lab class, electrical engineering lab class. I was in a group of four of us. There were me, it was me and three other guys in the class. And as you might expect, in a lab class, we did everything together as a lab group, meaning that everybody in the group 
did the labs together, wrote the reports together, got the same grade together. So it was a good idea to choose your lab partners wisely. So got the grade together. One day we walked into lab and the instructor said, today we're having a pop quiz and everyone's on your own, which was really bad news for me because I was not ready for that. So, so the instructor hands out the pop quiz and I'm looking at this thing thinking, I am, I'm dead. I mean, my, my grade just went down there because I didn't know anything on the thing. So I did my very, very best, turned it in, knowing I'd bombed it. A few days later, the instructor returns the test to the class and my worst fears were confirmed. I failed the test, fell in grade. So I'm sitting there looking at my test paper as he's handing them out, thinking to myself, I am never going to be able to pull this grade up in this class. I just, I just ruined my entire grade. After the instructor handed out all the test papers, he went to the front of the class and he said, I was a little disappointed in the grades on this pop quiz. He said, so here's what I'm going to do. He decided to be gracious and merciful. Here's what he decided. Here's what he said. Since this is a lab class, and since you do all of your work together, I am going to award everyone in each of your groups the grade of the highest grade in your group. So whoever scored highest on the pop quiz in our group, that was the grade we were all going to get. And I'm telling you, when he said that, it was like a cloud lifted. I was like, whoa, that was close. So I turned around to the table I was at, and I compared test grades with all of my partners, and mine was the highest grade. (laughs) All right. All right, now, follow me. Here's the point of that. Here's the point. The instructor extended grace and mercy. But on my end, there was nobody that could help me. I had a failing grade and nobody in my group had a passing grade. Why is it that only the Messiah, the Son of God, could say something like this? Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Here's how. Jesus is the only one who aced the exam of life. And God in his grace and mercy offers to every single one of us who, by the way, have all failed the exam. God in his grace and mercy offers to make Jesus score our score. But Jesus' perfect score on the exam must be accepted before it becomes yours. Let's suppose, just hypothetically, you're standing at heaven's gate. You're standing on this side, God's standing on the other. And through the gate, God says, why should I let you into a perfect, holy place? If your response is, well, I've tried to be a good person. In fact, if I'm honest, I'm better than most people were on earth. I'm, a be- I'm an above average person. I've tried to be good, a good person. If that's your response, God is going to look back at you through the gate and say, I'm sorry, but only perfection lives here. How is... Now, how is it that we in our imperfection get into a perfect place called heaven only by making Jesus' perfect score ours? I wonder if there are people here this morning and you're still trusting yourself to get to heaven instead of trusting Jesus. Jesus is the only way to heaven. If you this morning as I've been talking have felt a knocking on your heart's door. Can I explain to you what that is? That's God knocking at the door of your heart, asking to come in, asking for you to accept him as your Savior and as your Lord. I'd like to lead the entire room in a prayer whereby many of us have come to know God personally and many of us know for absolutely certain That heaven is our eternal destiny. Not because of what we've done, but because of what Jesus has done for us. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes.
you'd like to respond to God's wooing at your heart's door this morning, pray something like this. Dear God, I admit I've sinned. I've blown it. And I'm desperate for your forgiveness. I believe Jesus, your son, died on a cross in my place. Then three days later, he rose from the dead. I place all of my trust in what Jesus did for me to rescue me from my sin and to make heaven my eternal home. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Everyone looking this way. If that was your heart's prayer this morning, uh, the Bible says a miracle just happened. You just became adopted into God's family. That is a, it is a mind-blowing thing what happens when a person trusts Jesus for forgiveness of their sin. Uh, to help you understand more about that, we have literature available for you back at guest services. That's located in our grand foyer. If you prayed along with me especially, please go by and receive it from us. It's free of charge. We just want you to know what it means to follow Jesus. We've come to the time in our service that we call our response time. This is your chance to respond to whatever it is God's done in your heart and life today. As we enter the Thanksgiving week, perhaps this would be a good time just to kneel your hearts before God and thank Him for who He is, for what He's done for you, for the grace and the mercy that He has extended, and for the life of His dear Son to make heaven possible for us. Perhaps you would just like to spend some time thanking God during this Thanksgiving week. However God leads you, you're welcome to come. Let's all stand together. And as the music plays, let's each one of us respond right now.